Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the, the work of my team here. So um, Rosie Ware um, is the postdoc on the project, um, was around for the first three years. Unfortunately, she can't make it here today. She's moved on to, to new pastures. Um, and um, Becky and, and Rosie here are two PhD students um, who've, who've worked over the past uh, few years on some of the stuff I'm going to talk about here. Um, incredibly hard at times. So um, for the uninitiated, sedimentary DNA is ancient DNA um, that occurs freely in sediments. Um, and it comes from a, a number of different types of, uh, of sediments. And as, a, as an area, it's about a decade and a half just over um, in age. So we get, typically get stuff from permafrosts. Um, there has been some river systems and lake systems, um, ice cores. There's fantastic work um, that's coming out on cave sediments and, and hominin um, in evolution uh, currently. Um, and obviously marine cores, which we're going to talk about um, today. So taking these back to the beginning of, of the Lost Frontiers project, um, I'm, and I've stolen here my favourite rendering from Martin um, of the landscape as, as we understand it to look, um, um, just to, to, to visualise what's going on. Um, we had this fairly sort of um, simple idea that we were going to use DNA to populate the landscape, so we'll bung things like um, trees on it. But like I say, sedimentary DNA is a, it's still a developing field, and particularly at this time, there were um, a number of challenges to overcome. Um, not least the most basic is it is it really there? Um, is it real? Can we can we actually um, determine what types of organisms are there? Which is which is not a trivial problem, as you'll see in a moment. Um, kind of connected to the establishing that it's real in the first place. And then can we say things about the, um, the frequency uh, of, of organisms um, in the landscape, something about the, um, the, the biomass, um, which I won't talk about so much, but it did come up um, when we were analysing the tsunami um, stuff uh, a year or so ago. And then we, we move on to questions about how, how the DNA that we see that's there and we think we know what it is and we're pretty sure it's genuine how did it get there and we'll, we'll move on to that later in the talk as well so starting off with the is it there uh there we go excuse me is it there um we have um various uh, um aspects here so we we need to understand how DNA um, breakdown occurs in the environment. And I shall begin on by talking about that. And we also talk about the, these other aspects of authentication, phylogenetic assignation, um, and um, some of the issues of, of taphonomy that we're coming to really just now that all the data is coming together. So of all the different ways that DNA can um, potentially break down, we were thinking about this a lot in the 90s, it turns out that it mostly only breaks down in two um, ways that we see um, in ancient DNA. And both of those are hydrolytically driven. So we get a depurination um, process. I'll get my uh, laser pointer up here. Okay, so um, depurination, which basically knocks out a purine base, one of the bases um, in, in, in the DNA chain, which exposes the backbone. And that leads to fragmentation. Um, so when we look at DNA reads, DNA sequences, um, we tend to see um, quite short sequences. Um, we will see a distribution um, of, of DNA sequences that looks something like this. In reality, the, the, the distribution of DNA molecules actually follows this sort of exponential um, distribution. And we tend not to see these when we're doing our analyses, partly because they're not being um, extracted in the DNA process and partly because we can't process them bioinformatically. There's not enough information, they're not long enough. But the important point here um, uh, to make is that it's not really the mode here that's the important um, part of the maths. It's the parameter that describes this exponential slope, which is called lambda. And that'll pop up in a different guise um, a little bit later in the talk. Um, and the second uh, type of uh, breakdown is um, this, this process down here of deamination, where cytosine, one of the four bases of DNA, will lose an amine group where it actually becomes a uracil, which is the RNA equivalent of a thymine. So we actually get a change in the DNA sequence. 
And that shows up on the ends of molecules. And that's become over the past decade or so, the standard way of identifying whether your DNA is really ancient or not. Or not. So this, this, this graph here um, demonstrates the length of a DNA molecule. And then towards the end, it's showing numbers of mismatches or proportions of mismatch. And this red line ticking up here is showing that it's finding thiamines when it expects to see cytosines, when it compares DNA sequences to a database. Okay, so those are our two basic sorts of um, parameters. Now, a few years back, our group um, started looking um, in quite intensely um, at environmental correlations to DNA breakdown, um, partly in the wake of our first um, work with, with Vince, actually, um, around 2014, 2015, looking at the Boldner Cliff um, sites. Um, and in this, in this particular um, study here, we looked at about 108, all, basically all the paleogenomic data that was around at the time, about 183 studies, um, and correlated with environmental variables to understand um, how you can explain that fragmentation. So this is that lambda variable. And the important thing that I need to say from the start, and again, this is quite important in understanding um, the taphonomy of the DNA in, in the Stoggerland landscape, is fragmentation doesn't increase with age in a noticeable kind of a way when we, we take stuff out. That's because fragmentation happens very quickly. Um, um, and um, after, after that, it's very difficult to tell the difference between say 10,000 years and 500,000 year old um, DNA. Um, on the other hand, deamination, that change from a cytosine to a thymine does increase over time. Now, what that tells us is that DNA in the environment isn't continually breaking up over time. It's basically disappearing in signal because of um, bulk diffusion processes. So it all depends on, about how closed your system is. So things like bones, like petrous bones in the skull, which are very, very dense, are great closed systems. So they're just as damaged um, as, as any other DNA of the same age. But, but because they're being held in a small box, um, there's more of them. So it's basically a frequency game um, that we're playing here. So we expect to see um, DNA damage correlate with environment time. Um, and a first sort of glimpse at um, the, the type of thing that we're seeing from, from the Doggerland data is that pretty much seems to be the case. We say we got um, peat, which are more acidic environments. You get a lot more in the way of hydrolysis going on there. We see more um, damage, so greater lambda values here. Whereas if you go to more um, uh, salty environments, so there are good reasons, I don't really have time to go into why salt um, will slow down the process, you see, you see less damage. So we've got a nice sort of correlation um, between um, environment and the level of DNA damage. So we needed to do a number of innovations in this project um, to be able to study uh, the, the, the sedimentary DNA. And the first of which was establishing an approach to authentication. So this reflects a lot of the work that actually Rosie Everett's been doing during her, her PhD. But what we really need to see is the ends of the DNA molecules. Now, although authentication has been used for the past decade or so as a, as a method of, 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 of um, identifying the, the, whether your ancient DNA is real or not, the conventional approaches require a huge um, number of DNA sequences from a single species to be mapped against a genome. And our problem is that we're, we're basically got a metagenomic um, situation here where we'll have maybe just a few reads from each different species. So we've developed a tool called MetaDamage which will shortly um, be available for download through um, the uh, uh, unconventionally um, named GitHub, um, been a beloved of, of, of computer geek types um, to download the program. And it should be immensely useful um, to, the, to the sedimentary DNA community. And basically this, this, this gives a, that sort of typical output um, showing, um, as you can see in our embryo fighter, um, we've, got some, we've got damage on the ends of the molecules, and we've got a confidence interval um, because we can deal with quite low numbers of reads. This has actually got a fair number here, 3,000, but we can, we can be really quite sensitive. We can go down into just a few hundred reads and still see um, a damaged signal, which is immensely powerful um, relative to what's available out there at the moment. Okay, so we've got a process of, of identifying whether our DNA is real or not. And then we've also been developing um, this um, phylogenetic assignation approach, 
um, so so-called PIA or phylogenetic intersection analysis, which um, is published and available for download. And it's a very stringent pipeline um, because once you are using um, metagenomic DNA in order to get that authentication signal, you're basically looking anywhere in the genome. So it becomes actually quite difficult to accurately um, uh, say what organism you've got. So quite briefly, what this, this algorithm will do, will give you a phylogenetic range in which um, your organism um, can occur. And it also, um, uh, from, from the way the algorithm is set up, um, starts off with the, the starting assumption that the DNA you're looking for may not be in the database, and quite often it isn't. Um, so it takes into account um, database um, uh, density of, of occupation. I'm not going to go into that too much, but the, the, the long and the short of it is we, we're about 90% um, plus confident of our, of our phylogenetic assignations, sometimes more, sometimes less. Okay, so <clears throat> the third innovation to deal with sedimentary DNA is um, to worry about DNA movement post deposition. So whether there's leaching up or down, um, and this has been a big a big problem in um, uh, terrestrial um, sediments in particular. Um, so what we've done here, and you're not going to see too much uh, of this, is but it's a statistical framework to test whether samples are different from each other. Um, using things like beta distributions um, to check to see whether there's any homogenization um, process going on. Okay, and then the last um, thing we did again, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, but it's in the um, it's in the tsunami paper in in geosciences, is to get a proxy of biomass. So the the amount of DNA that's left behind by an organism is a function of the organism's size and the size of its genome. So that takes into account those two factors. So things with very large genomes are going to be more present, especially if they're large. Um, and in that way, we could show during the, the tsunami episode that we get this increased presence of biomass of trees um, in core um, 1A. Okay, so that's giving you the background. Um, what I'm going to talk about um, in our data here, and again, like all the other talks previously, we are literally just analysing this at the moment and in very early stages of integrating, uh, particularly with the other um, environmental um, sources. Um, I'm going to talk about this line of cores um, going up and down the river system. So this is a lot of work that was generated by um, Becky um, um, more recently, and then Rosie Ware in, in the first um, few years of, of the project, and a little mention of um, some cores up here, so particularly core 27. Right, so I've, I've shown you this already. We are generally quite happy that our, that our data are genuine um, ancient DNA. As you can see, all our PIA authenticated um, data is over 4 million reads, and we can see that in our extraction banks, we don't see damaged um, DNA coming through. So we're pretty, we're pretty confident in um, the data that we've produced. So that's what the data look like. Um, the problem from here on in is we've got about 600 plus taxa, um, which would make quite awful um, sort of paralogs of, of pollen diagrams and diatom diagrams. So what we've done is um, to analyze the, the, co the correlation of occurrence um, of organisms together. So basically we've, we've got a, um, a correlation coefficient matrix um, which tells us which taxa occur with which other taxa. It helps get rid of some of the degener degeneracy. Um, so we, sometimes we've got family, family level assignation, sometimes they're genus level, um, and often those, are, those occur in together because they're the same, the same organism. We can invert those into um, um, a distance matrix um, from which we can make a principal component analysis, a principal, more accurately, principal coordinate analysis. And from there, we can skip up um, into dimensional space, um, making hypercubes. So um, that's a fancy term. You can just think of it in three dimensions. If you had a three-dimensional graph and just broke it up into squares, into cubes, we're looking um, for, for, for similar occupancy of the various different taxa. And from that, we build what we call plant guilds. Um, so those represent um, basically different depositional um, categories of, of plant taxa. And I'm going to talk to you mostly about plant taxa um, in this, um, because there's a lot more of, of plant data than anything else. Okay, so we've got about 
56, no, we're not about, exactly, 56 um, plant guilds, and these are they. Um, and some, some are more interesting than others. And some, even if we skip up to 10 dimensions, remain quite large. So this one in particular here, we've still got 60 taxa or so in here that do not want to um, stop holding hands with each other. So they, they always co-occur together. Um, and then we've got other groups. Um, so up here, we've got our, our um, zostra, so seagrass group. So this is our representation of marine environment. environment. Um, and we have other groups that represent some things like reeds. So I'm going to pick out some color codes here. Um, so green, remember, represents this sort of marine inundation. We've got a reedy group here in green. We've got a grassy group here in brown. Um, and very much like Ben was talking about earlier, we've got this um, a lot of salix, a lot of willow um, occurring, willow and friends. And then this this big group here, you'll see it's got a lot of it's got a lot of um, taxa in it, but it doesn't feature very much. It's very restricted geographically. And then I will come to this towards the end of, of the talk. We've got some um, interesting groups. I was I noticed quite early on um, this occurrence of Juglandaceae and you'll see next door Juglans, so walnut, um, which um, both surprised me, um, worried me um, and excited me in, in turn. So I was uh, driving my group up, up the wall, I think, over, over the, ne the next couple of years, trying to establish whether this was a, a real signal or, or not. Um, we'll come back to that um, a bit later. So we've got this guild structure, and what we can do is go through each of our samples in the course, and there are 322 um, in all, and we can ask of that, of that sample what the guild structure is, what percentage of the guilds are represented. And we end up with this much um, simpler sort of thing to look at. Um, so this is a typical um, three types of, of guild that we see a lot of. So we've got this marine kind of um, uh, situation going on here, Zostra dominated, we've got a willow dominated, and grassland dominated, often, often with, with that reed group with it as well. Okay, so if we look at those against um, sediments, now sorry because we're going up to bird's eye view, it's very difficult to pick out. Um, here and the, the, the key hasn't perfectly rendered, but the general point I wanted to make here was that we see um, a lot of changes in sediment types, so a change in depositional um, uh, regime um, going on without much in the way of a change in the um, uh, plant guild structure. It doesn't look like the incoming sediments are changing um, the plant makeups um, that we see. Um, and similarly, we, we have plants um, changing over time without the, um, the, the, the co-change with um, the sediments. So my first impression of this data is that the sediments coming in are not really um, driving um, the, um, the plant presence, um, which sort of takes us to the first step of, of, of thinking about the DNA um, depositional model here. So in, thing, in cases like Zostra and um, um, uh, reeds, we might expect them to be actually um, in situ. And then things like um, Salix and the other trees, we, 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 we have a sort of more proximal si um, situation going on where T-position is anybody's guess, um, leaves coming in. And then we've got our sediment sources um, coming in here. And I've, I've sort of formalized this a little bit. So we've got our influx from sediments, but um, and we're coming back to the importance of um, the, the um, lambda and, and the half-life of DNA. You've got DNA disappearing from the water or decaying. Disappearing is probably a better, better um, word for, for, for D there. So our, deep, our, our deposition of DNA is basically a sum of these various different factors, and it's got to be the influx minus the, the decay. And obviously we've got efflux going on here. And what it seems to me is that S and H, for the most part, are larger than I minus T. Um, and here we have um, just building up. So what's an important factor here is the half-life of water, of, of DNA in water. And we do know from sedimentary, I'm sorry, from modern eDNA studies that that lambda, and this is the same lambda that I showed you at the beginning, is greater than one. That means that the half-life of DNA in, in water systems is typically less than an hour. 
So this stuff is getting stripped out um, very, very quickly. So I expect under normal conditions that um, DNA is not really coming in on, on sediments influxing. Um, but when you have a sudden influx, such as the tsunami, um, and we do have examples of sudden gra gravel deposits, then this value of I minus DT can suddenly increase and have more of an influence. So we can have influential um, uh, 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 aspects going on there. So I'm under the impression at the moment that actually what we're seeing in the DNA is mostly um, a local um, deposition of DNA. Okay, and this sort of um, uh, summarizes uh, what I'm saying. I'm going to have to speed up. So these, these other points you can ask me about afterwards. Um, so here's the river system. And we've got, uh, we've got a couple of transects um, going up the river system and then across. Um, and that is um, going to be displayed in the next slide. We also have ELF 27, which is around up here somewhere that we're going to look at now. That's just to remind you what the guild structures tend to look like. Um, and then there's this other guild structure which turns up, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this has that walnut signal um, that I was talking about previously. Okay, again, we've gone up to bird's eye view. So this is the southern river system with the mouth here moving up to the top. And then we've got the second transect across the top there. And then we've got seven and 20 that Ben and Tom were just talking about a little further away. And then 27 further away again, and 22 is right up on Dogger Island. And what we've got here is the samples stacked against all the various different radiocarbon and OSL dates. And this is this is sitting with Tim and um, and Kevin at the moment um, to to um, to map against sort of age models. So what we have here is some absolute dates, and samples tend to be stacked around. You see, we've got an OSL date here, and samples stacked up. Uh, Around. So we've got a sort of a first impression of the age distribution um, going on here. And um, broadly speaking, you can see lots of that green structure of Zostra um, going up and around the top here. And in the centre here, you've got lots of Salix um, structures um, going on. And over time, we've sort of got this broad um, inundation impression across cores um, going on. Um, we can. I can take you through the the. I'm not sure I've got enough time actually to take you through in in too much detail. But we've got in in early stages. Um, we've got willow down in 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 the bottom here. So this is deep in the Pleistocene, um, in the sort of river mouth cores. And we've got um, willow. We've got cold um, taxa like the dryas and um, ericaceae. Um, and then um, as we move into sort of eleven and a half to thirteen and a half. Um, thousand years ago, we're sort of spanning that sort of Alarod and Younger Dryas periods, um, where we're seeing again some some Dryas going on. But uh, what I shall actually start showing you is some of the distribution of some of the interesting um, taxa going on here. So we've got Dryas popping up around about the Younger Dryas. It also pops up later on, and we can also just to demonstrate the um, the, the usefulness of the guilds here. Um, we fill that, that information out a little bit more if we've got the, the guild that occupies, um, that has Dryas as a member. So it's, it's a sort of a cold guild, interestingly, popping up um, in this period around, around here also. And if we look at um, something like Betulaceae, so this is birch, um, birch and older actually, um, <clears throat> we see that it, it pops up all over the place um, fairly early on, but it uniform throughout the cores. Um, something like Coralus, we've got it turning up. We've got it turning up very early. Um, so we've got what might be um, presence of Coralus um, in, in Alarod period. Um, and then um, quite similar to, I think, what Ben was showing later, we've got this sudden appearance of it around about that sort of 10 and a half year, um, 10 and a half thousand year mark um, over time. And again, then pretty much pops up everywhere. And then we've also got um, oaks following a similar sort of um, distribution, but that occurring um, fairly fairly early here. Okay. More interestingly, um, I, I think in some ways is is, is lime. Um, so we've got lime, and I know this is a complex deposit um, over here, um, off off offshore, um, quite old in, in Elf twenty seven. 
um, but occurring you know, a, 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 a couple of a thousand or two years um, earlier than the UK mainland. So um, it looks like it's um, generally a bit warmer earlier. Um, uh, again, pending pending the development of, of age models um, as we as we sort of integrate everything together. Um, and there, there's an example of where we've looked at specifically at these at these tilia reeds, and these are the ones that have been through extreme um, um, sorting, and we see a damage signal. We're pretty sure that's real lime. Okay, so just sort of getting towards the end, we've got the presence of this this juggling signal, so this walnut signal. Now, walnut, um, we don't expect to be um, in, in Northwestern Europe, um, as I'm sure you appreciate, and it doesn't produce a lot of pollen either. Um, recent studies do um, place it in, in sort of South French um, glacial refugia, but um, in the archeological record, actually the oldest walnut remains are about 10 and a half thousand years ago from Spain. And there's quite a long tradition um, of using walnut um, or moving um, walnut around. And what we're seeing here is, is what's apparently is about from 11.3 um, thousand years up to, up to about eight and a half um, thousand years um, of presence um, of, of walnut, and then much later in much lower quantities further up the valley. Now, the walnut signal is real. Um, so it's it's definitely walnut. There are 100% matches, and there's not really anything we can mistake it for. And um, and it's it's uh, it's it's genuinely um, ancient stuff. So it also occurs in its guilds, as I remind you here, with some typical um, disturbance indicators like nettles um, and wheat. Uh, not that's sorry, not wheat. That's traticia. It's the wheat tribe, but we actual wheat is. Um, is 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 not there in the system so we've just got wild um cereals going on so um i'm currently thinking uh, we're developing the opinion that this is a possible anthropogenic um signal um so if we were to put that on back onto that that landscape um this is where it occurs um and and the size of the trees here are uh relative to frequency so that's your your 11 and a half um um, to eight, well, 11.3 to, to eight and a half um, window. And then much later on, we get small um, instances of it's further up upstream and then eventually up around um, core seven. So I've burned up um, quite a lot of time here, but um, broadly speaking, again, it's a rapid overview of everything that's going on. Um, the sedimentary DNA appears to be mostly um, um, local deposition. This is something we're digging into and trying to understand at the moment. Um, um, and we're developing depositional models as we speak. So we're in the process of integrating with the rest um, of the team. Um, we basically see a, a willow um, tundra to start off with, and like the others, we're, we, we move into a, an oak birch um, woodland. Um, and we can broadly see the inundation process going on. And I put it to you that there's possibly an anthropogenic um, signal in the data. Okay, so this has been, uh, again, a, a, a lot of um, teamwork. Um, so thanks to the broader team and particularly the dating guys um, at the moment. Um, and I also say an extra thanks to um, a guy called Logan Kister, who was um, a fellow in my group um, uh, for a few years back, who we still interact with. It's helped us out um, with some of the analyses here. And at that, I shall stop. Um, I shall stop share. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, you know, we're right on the uh, right on the hour, but I think we should have uh, time for a few questions as we're, we're going into a one-hour lunch break here. Um, some that have come up: um, the, the the obvious one of uh, what animal DNA uh, do you have, or any? Right. So it would have been a two-hour talk if um, <laughs> if we were going to we were going to cover that as well. So, well, like I was saying, the, the, there is a lot more of the plant DNA, um, and with that, a lot more interpretation to be done um, with the plant DNA. Animals do turn up, um, and they're very low frequency, so it's very hard to put um, sort of statistical surety on anything that we see there. But we see broad, um, broad trends. I mean, you, 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 the usual sorts of suspects. Um, you know, they're. they're, they're there are going to be boar and, and um, bovids uh, and that sort of thing, canids in the system. Um, interestingly, Becky 
um, found um, European turtles um, in the data, which she traced through. Um, so for a time, and we might still be thinking this actually, that there's, there's, a, there's a mild aspect to, to the landscape um, um, at, at, some, at some time points. Um, but uh, there's not a huge amount to say really on the animal front. Okay, um, so Mark Bateman's asking, is there any reason to believe changes in DNA not seen in sediment changes could be due to post-depositional bioturbation? So, right, yes. Yeah, so this is one of the things that we worried about from the get-go, and that's what we, we did our statistical framework. So what I, what I should have pointed out, actually, when, we showed you, when I showed you the broad um, data in its raw form, is that um, for, the, for the most part across cores, we see stratigraphical integrity. So they are statistically different um, to each other as you move up and down the cores, which tells us that DNA hasn't been moving. Um, so we, we don't, I mean, there's always going to be exceptions to the rule, obviously, but as, as a rule, it doesn't look like the DNA has moved much since deposition. And uh, Christopher Brook is asking about the uh, difference in the half-life of DNA between fresh and saline water. Okay, so then, so, okay, there are two aspects there. Um, in free water, you're, it's all going to be about diffusion. So um, it, 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 it's going to be similarly quick to get rid of. In terms of um, actual breakdown, so there's two different aspects to, to half-life here. Um, if you are in a high ionic environment, what you do is you interfere with the hydrolysis process. It, it basically works on the polarity of molecules. And um, we have done some work on this. And we, we see for, for the sorts of temperatures that you expect in, in, in um, seawater, about a 16 fold reduction in the rate of um, DNA breakdown in terms of um, accumulation of um, deamination signals. Um, but in terms of, of the actual signal disappearing, that's the DNA sort of diffusing out. So there wouldn't be such a great difference. So it's all about the DNA getting fixed in situ. Once it's fixed, then it'll last a lot longer in a saline environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then there's a few around um, the macrofossil traces of juglans and, and the, the uh, set of DNA Clarify how certain this is late glacial Holocene and not derived samples, given that the macrofossils such as uh, Azalea are present in your cores and commonly found in earlier Pleistocene deposits. So my thinking on, so this was suggested as well, we're trying, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm presenting this to the group and they're trying to understand, I wouldn't say I persuaded everybody for sure. Um, but my thinking is when, um, when um, sediments are redistributed, um, and the, the, the move, so you've got com complexity going on. You, you come into the situation where you've got this half-life of, of DNA coming into play. So where you've got rearrangement of sediments, I think you lose that old DNA. So I don't think this is an old interglacial um, um, <clears throat> deposition. Now, the exception to that rule, I would say, would be when you get a sudden influx, like a violent event that tears up a load of, 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 of sediment such that it remains cloudy. And again, we're out of, out, out, outside of my area of expertise. It'd be a question for Tim, but I would imagine that's the sort of situation that you retain your ISL signal. So the, the sediments remain looking old. So this, is, this was my point here that um, the, 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 the DNA as it's going down, I think should reflect the age that the sediment appears to be by the, by the proxy's measurements, even though that might actually be older sediment but the osl signal i think it probably should match to so uh, my, my current thinking and again we're at, we're at early stages is is that i don't think it's some um, super old um dna from a previous integration whether it's later um you know, like modern walnut going in i'm not sure how it can be but it does show the damage you know that's that's consistent with with everything else of that age um mm -hmm. It seems to match. Yeah, and I think we'll be hearing more about that consistency in ages later um, later on this afternoon, probably um, on some of the OSL profiling and, and, and turnabout. So we can leave that again for commentary then. Um, a question here from Melanie Munt um, mentioned that it's pro particularly problematic in terrestrial environments for post depositional movement of the set of DNA. But in terms of submerged landscapes, 
is there likely to be any possible ability of the existence of um, set of DNA where preserving materials are largely absent or where the environment is particularly turbulent? Um, so that question seems to be, can you get DNA when you don't have mac macrofossils broadly? Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there's, there's, there's a fairly solid um, track record of that in the literature um, now. Um, and we're, we're starting to understand um, uh, better um, in terms of DNA decay processes, um, that that's, that, that's um, within the realms of possibility. What I would say the area generally in, in ancient DNA and sedimentary DNA in particular is we, we don't know, um, we don't understand yet um, in detail the interactions with surfaces of the DNA molecule. So um, it, it, it's not just, um, it's the same with, with proteins as well. The, 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 the preservation in the in, in environment that you're, to, you're talking about here is largely about um, the exclusion um, of water to, to um, sites of, of, of reaction. So if you, if you get tight binding, so we anecdotally, everybody knows in the field that if you've got clay, you've got silica, DNA binds to silica, um, you tend to see better preservation going on. So these things can potentially be held in certain substrates um, for, for long after there's any um, larger um, macrofossil um, remain. So and there's something about it being turbulent. Whoops. Yeah, I think, I think the environment of deposition, I presume, in that case. Yeah, um, I don't think um, DNA doesn't do terribly well in a in a in a turbulent um, situation. I mean, this is how we break DNA up in the laboratory by rattling it through um, um, sort of physical um, um, stress. So I I would not expect, and in, in a turbulent situation, I would have thought the other process diffusion would probably um, kick in. Mm -hmm. But that said, um, I mean, it depends what you mean by turbulent. So when we see the tsunami episode, it's a very short period of time. Um, and probably this stuff is being brought in actually on biological, physical material being dumped, trees being dumped um, in the situation. And the DNA is there a long time after the trees have rotted. 